This is a CW Spiral, a podcast run by two Barties and a Bughead. We're your hosts, Sabrina Reed, Michael Patterson, and Reed Gowden. Bringing you history about the network, the latest news, and in-depth spoiler-filled discussions of some of our favorite shows on the CW. Finally, we have some CW news to share. Though I think, based on the tweets, the responses to the tweets we've gotten, it's not news that anyone was really waiting for. I mean, everyone wants to hear about their shows being renewed. And instead, the CW, according to what Deadline hears, has acquired... They're always hearing stuff. <laughs> They're always hearing. <laughs> they've, acquired, they've acquired F-Boy Island Season 3. Uh, F-Boy Island used to be on HBO Max. Uh, it was pulled from the streamer, not because it wasn't a show that drew traffic, but because HBO Max was... They're in a transitionary phase and they're phasing out certain bits of reality TV series, mainly stuff that isn't like home development or cooking um, because of the Discovery brand. So FBoy Island actually is a title that is a good get for the CW and meets its brand, even though it's interesting because Next Star was like 58 year olds come to us and now it's like 58 year olds likely not watching FBoy Island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, does, it seems like the average CW viewer not booking a trip to FY Island <laughs> <No>. <laughs> or F Girl Island. <laughs> the, oh, yes, the spinoff that they deadline also hears CW has picked up. It's all happening. Um, but no, I don't, I'm not excited about this show. I'm not going to watch this show, but I do agree that, like, as far as a marketing standpoint, this sounds more like a CW show than like golf or even 100 days to end day like every time i hear about unscripted a little bit of me dies inside because i want scripted news but like i'm w kind of with this just on a branding standpoint because this feels like something that might have entered on the cw 14 years ago so i a little bit of nostalgia in this like strange new era I, i'm all for so good luck to it that's all i'll say <laughs> Yeah, I feel the same. I might end up checking it out just to see what it would look like for the CW, what the CW would be doing. Like, is it like an island in the US rather than an island elsewhere? Like, what's the budget going to be? Uh, but other than that, it's just, it is on brand for the CW more than the other unscripted content that they are trying to sell us like the golf. Though I am here for a hundred days to indie, I will be watching. Um, and they have, um, was it Joke Off that's coming in April too, which I will not be watching that. I don't, but I guess for cracking jokes, I have not looked into what, the, what that's <laughs> supposed to be, what it's supposed to be about. It just doesn't really feel like it's on brand for the CW, but okay. You know what? Whatever keeps the lights on. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. have bills to pay. I can't fault them. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, which is why I'm also excited that the there's possible horror coming to the CW. I mean, they had two sentence horror stories. I don't know how well that did on um the sub CW. Perhaps well, I don't know. Uh, but like Rad Sports in an interview interview from February said they had spoken to Bloomhouse and they're trying to figure out how to do low cost horror on the CW, which that could be fun. Like I'm thinking like summer programming, watching people scream in the woods and go running covered in blood. Like it could just be a fun time on the network. Yeah, I can get on board with that. I feel like, that, again, not my cup of tea, not something I'd be particularly invested in. But again, I think that's a, a smart move. I'm pretty sure, not, not to give us credit, but like we mentioned movies on the CW about this time last year when they were looking for new things to do. And no budget horror seems to be the way to go for many and uh, networks kind of like to make their mark and a lot of them do their own thing with it. So I feel like CW could do that. What would a CW original horror movie look like? And again, if it's cheap, it's cheerful and uh, I'm sure it'll have to like behave as far as some boundaries go. But I mean, like, I feel like those movies could be successful even after they are on the CW and like get the network like streaming deals as far as where, where the movies housed and distribution deals in different parts of the world. So like, go for it try new things and this is of all the new things i've heard of them trying this is one i feel like i can get behind there's a there's a market for uh camp <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i think this network at one point did camp really well and this is the perfect chance to do like a summer limited series or a summer tr trilogy of movies like fear street or something like mm -hmm. i don't know i can see, i can see the vision and although i'm not like super into horror like i think the the theme the listeners are going to hear from us is at least it's not golf 
<laughs> that's true i just anything but the golf at this point i do think if like if nickelodeon can do who's afraid of the dark you know reboot that i feel like the cw could do an aged up for like it's mm-hmm. it's it's fine they did have killer camp which was an acquisition from canada i think or was it the uk and then they made it a u.s version and that didn't do quite well but that was like the wrong kind of camp i think we're kind of over horror competition series that are low budget and people are pretending to be something they're not so to have an actual storyline that works could be something that people do tune into like you have nothing to do on a saturday a cw original movie is coming on it's like i don't know <laughs> murders in the pine or something (laughs) we need something to build a sense of community that we can all either hate watch together and we low-key love it or that's actually really good and we're watching it and we enjoy it Mm -hmm. we need to get back to the community aspect of the cw because that has really fallen apart (laughs) that's true we do need to and horcus for some reason i feel like horror could do it (laughs) just uh, one night horror brings people together i mean look at scream six yeah, true. very true. Very Everybody true. loves these movies. They do. And the the CW could do it. I feel like they can. I mean, if we can all agree that we love Riverdale and hate Riverdale and feel attached to Riverdale and feel like, I don't know, that we can't leave Riverdale, I think we can do that with a horror movie. This is leading us into the season seven spoiler-free mm-hmm. review for the, the premiere, um, which... I know everyone's like, final season of, of Riverdale, it's finally time that we can say goodbye to this town. And we were like, you know, y'all could have made it 13 episodes and we would have been good, but they have a 20 episode account. And I kind of feel like they need the 20 episodes after seeing this premiere. Um, one word for me, fantastic, fantastic premiere. Retweet. Mm-hmm. All of the above. Um I like. I think the best way to start is we were not the biggest fans of season six, and you know when a show like has feels like it's reached this kind of like stale point that you'd be okay letting it go no matter how much you love it. Season seven is the refresh that Riverdale needed. It's new, it's young, it's vibrant, and it's just it's fun. And I think that's the most important thing we can take yeah. away from it. So much fun. I Riverdale kind of it was still fun sometimes. But a lot of season six felt like work. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's definitely more fun back in Riverdale. And it's, it's just so reinvigorating. Mm-hmm. The energy this season has already. Like it feels like they've been, even if this wasn't the plan from day one, it feels like such a natural and perfect place to land for a final season. Like each season has kind of had like this thematic identity and aesthetic and Going back to the 50s is such a great homage, not even to just the comics that it's based on, but the first season when it always had this, Roberto, for as much as we do drag this man, because we want to keep him accountable, he has had such a singular vision aesthetically Mm -hmm. for the series. And this is, it's, it feels full circle. Like this is where the show needed to end. Even if it got a little complicated to getting here, um, being able to suspend your disbelief that like, yeah, these children can try and travel back to the 50s for no reason. Like, I don't know. I don't care. It fits. It works. And like Michael said, they all seem like they're having the time of their lives. So like get out of their comments and being like, we're just still on. They want to get out of this. It's like, no, they're having so much fun. And it's apparent in this episode. It is a lot. And I like how different tonally it is from this, the series opener. Like the series opener was fun, but it was also, it was broody and it gave a moody vibe. And it had this mm-hmm. like, the when you heard the, the Riverdale theme for the first time, you knew you were watching a thriller of some kind that was ridiculous, but also like you just couldn't turn away. And I feel like when season seven opens and you hear Rock Around the Clock, like it just sets the mood and the vibe so well, especially when you turn to Jughead. He's just like, I really am in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> like, and there's just, and there's a sweetness to it. There's a um a youthful brightness that also balances this storyline, which I'm gonna try very carefully not to spoil. Um, but 
this storyline that is timeless, that despite the fact that we're in the 50s, a lot of the issues the kids are dealing with are issues this generation of kids are dealing with. You have like the discovery of who you are as a person and coming of age, and then you have the horror of dealing with the actual reality of, you know, the adults running society and like one you wanting change and feeling like you need to push for change and not being heard. And I feel like that's just something all teenagers know. Like obviously you at some point you become an adult and so for some people they forget um that aspect of growing up. But Roberto hasn't. So I love the at attention um that is brought to like, hey, we're trying to figure ourselves out, but also there's this Emmett Teal situation and we're trying to figure out how to best discuss it in an environment in which we keep being told, don't worry about it, be a kid. But like, obviously you have to worry about it and they are kids, but they're kids dealing with the reality of the horrors of America. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the premiere kind of balances that really well because sometimes with Riverdale, there's so much going on that the more important stories get fallen by the wayside or this sometimes to, the end result isn't what it should have been. Whereas I feel like with season seven, there feels like a far more balance. They're telling those important stories, but also letting you see why the characters want to tell them who it's important to. And you get, to, you get even though there's definitely a reset in place, you get to learn a lot about who each person is very, very quickly. Some dynamics feel familiar year but some dynamics feel completely different so it I will keep saying the word reset, but it feels like that this has been just completely we have a clean slate right now. But the reset button has been pressed. But at the same time, you can see who people are. A lot, a lot every, the more everything changes, the more it stays the same. And I feel like that's definitely something going into Riverdale season seven to pay attention to. But I I cannot put into words just how excited I am for them to be able to balance like important stories, but also start new character arcs but also tie up older character arcs there's a lot going on here and yeah again i'll join that bandwagon and say i'm glad they have 20 episodes to do it because it needs time to breathe i feel like one of riverdale's issues like i mentioned is when some of the stories get fallen by the wayside is that it has too much to do and not enough time to do it which is incredible considering it's had 22 episode seasons but this one, for example, I feel like because it has a longer season, even though it's a final season, suddenly the stories are starting to breathe. And I think that's re really important in this show because this is the last time you get to spend this amount of time with these characters and they're really making the most of it. Hey, look, we've said what we've said about Riverdale. And in that moment, it was truth. Yeah, very much yes. so. <laughs> <laughs> We're allowed to be inconsistent with Riverdale. <laughs> <laughs> You have to grant us that because at the end of the day, it's like the, it's like when you're fighting with your, your sibling um, and like, you're allowed to say mean things to your sibling. But as soon as somebody else says, you're like, no, 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 no. That's, you know, I can only say that. Like, this is our Riverdale. We can say what we want. <laughs> We've been in the trenches. Like we're allowed. Um, but it, it does feel like such a reward for, you know, being, going through all of the, the ups and downs of the series like it's not ever, even if it's your favorite show of all time you're gonna hit a point where you're like oh my goodness this is dragging on it's not as good but to get to a final season that feels so exciting and brand new like this is we're seven seasons in and it's still able to surprise us and to make us feel excitement and that's amazing but i do i want to quickly pull out my soapbox dust it off and hop up there and speak directly to the shippers <laughs> <laughs> chill out <laughs> calm down it'll be okay <laughs> episode one we have 19 more <laughs> very true and I feel like we said this before, like our introduction has shippers in it. We all know what we like, and what chips we like and whatever, and that's fine. But I feel like the best way to enjoy Riverdale season seven is to turn off your mind and stop expecting things from it right out of the gate. Because at the end of the day, we're here with these characters one more time. A lot of people did not think we would get to this point. And it's pretty funny the moment I stopped wanting things from Riverdale is the moment it starts delivering because this feels like the highest standard. I mean, there's there's something to be said about when you let go of expectation. I think beautiful things can happen. I mean, mm -hmm. we prefer what we prefer, but like when you just decide like, I'm no longer going to beg for what I want because I, I there's a part of me that does kind of feel like that is unfair to like, you do have to like, if a show's kind of gone off track, hold people accountable and be like, 
where did we go wrong here? We need to reset the course, but constantly demanding things that you want from a show it doesn't feel genuine to the storytelling i'm willing to just be like roberto go where you may and i will tell you how i feel about it at the end <laughs> well, i don't know i'm just after watching this episode it was just again so reinvigorating to see some of these dynamics get mixed up in like actors we talked about this in the, in the uh, trailer reaction that we're seeing actors get to play together that didn't have storylines together in the past couple seasons like they get to have these moments again and to me as a longtime fan that's more exciting than seeing some couple be together at the beginning of the final season like I'm willing to go the lengths and see where the story it's not going to be easy we're here for a while like <laughs> we're in it so just kind of like releasing my own where like where I see the story going we can never predict the, what Riverdale's going to do so we can't. And it's also that like remembering where these at this point their kids, um, kids were at the end of the season six finale. Like, I'm sorry, y'all, but they weren't it didn't necessarily seem like they were together. <laughs> so like the yeah. only ship that like I feel like anyone would be should really be going into the premiere wondering about is of course Jabatha, because Jughead, we know, has his memories and you wanna know like what's up with Tabitha, like where is she in this in this universe? But that's about it. Like, I feel like um, when Roberta said he was going to reset everything, he truly meant he was going to reset everything. In some ways, these are the characters that we know. And in other ways, they're very much not. Like, so where we end up with the dynamics, it's going to be an adventure and a ride on its, own, on its own. I feel like save the ship arguments for whenever we do end up back in their present, which is, spoiler alert, going to be a long time <laughs> like it's weird <laughs> we are here in the 50s for for quite a bit um I'm not exactly sure where they are in filming but if they haven't gotten over like the halfway mark yet or they have we're still in the 50s so just have fun with that I feel like I understand that the compulsion to want to know that your ship is going to be endgame but I think one of the corrosive things about the proliferation of fandom past like the communities you would have online the way that everyone it's great that everyone can talk about their ships and speculate and whatnot one of the issues is it has now become such a thing for your ship to be endgame that people feel like if it's not you wasted your time on a show and it's like but unless the show is a romantic drama yeah uh, you have not wasted your time it's a drama with romance in it if you watch just for a ship then that is on you. It's not on yeah. the writer. Yeah, you're going to hurt your own feelings. Mm -hmm. And I'm not not saying I have not watched something for a ship. Definitely have. Definitely will again. But, <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, I am aware that because I'm doing that, that there there's a part, like, you have to have reality about, which is, like, if the ship ends, then jump the ship. Like, leave the show. If that's what you were there for. If it doesn't, se if it doesn't seem like they're going to come back or, you know, find what you did love about it and just stick around. Uh, let the writers write. Unless they're being awful, then hold them accountable. Or mm -hmm. if they're like baiting you beyond belief when they know that you want something and they keep teasing it and they're not giving it to you. That's one thing. But like, if it's just part of the story, buckle up, y'all. We're going to be here for 20 episodes. A lot can happen in that time. Mm -hmm. A lot can happen, as we know, considering Riverdale. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing with this show like at the end of the day this is one of those shows where and not everyone's going to be happy since there's so many different dynamics but let them get to the end of the season before you cast your judgments but the, we're, we're in such a good place right now and i think we're in for a one heck of an adventure and i just hope that people sit back enjoy the ride and appreciate the show for what it is because it's doing something incredibly exciting so just have a blast with it because i know the show will mm. but i will say because I know, Michael, you and I have torn the flash to pieces in its final run. That's a different critique from like saying, let Riverdale do its thing versus the flash doing its thing is upsetting its final season <laughs> only because of, of where you would, it's a filler season, I guess. Um, and Riverdale seems like we're telling a sprawling mm -hmm. story and it's, it's going to be an interesting one, a confusing one at points, but an interesting one. At yeah. least it's it seems focused right now. Like right. they have they have goals. <laughs> <laughs> they have a theme. They have 
things they're wanting to accomplish <laughs> from what I hear about the flash. They're just kind of like, yeah, let's do what we want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I, I I was thinking that when I was praising Riverdale after one episode, because I do sound quite hypocritical. But let me say this. I've watched the three Riverdale first episodes of the season and everything stays on course. We're still on track for a good season. If we were sent the first three episodes of The Flash, I'm not sure season premiere review would have been as positive. But <laughs> either way, either way, Riverdale is final season is currently in a better state than The Flash. And it's a sentence that I didn't even think I'd say when these shows were in their prime. So we'll see how it goes. But the my point is, we still don't know what to expect from Riverdale's final season, other than what I can confirm is high quality for all three episodes. So just have a fun with it because this show will thrive on giving us something to enjoy and that's what it does best it's bonkers 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 and it's, have a good time while you're watching it and i will be around in 10 years when everyone's like riverdale is kind of like super smart and great and campy and underrated and be like yeah where were you when it was on <laughs> yeah <laughs> you were you were in everybody's mentions complaining about it still being on that's where you were <laughs> I cannot wait for your think piece read when that happens <laughs> it'll just be that oprah gif where she's like <laughs> told you <laughs> we'll be doing the 10th anniversary of the cw spirals complaining about how people never appreciate it riverdale the first time around. giving it a 10th anniversary retrospective yes yes uh, but moving into superman and lois which i by the way i have to say it's fun being able to say riverdale was fantastic and then getting to move into superman and lois and being like superman superman and lois was fantastic like the whole pod is just going to be like fantastic fantastic yes. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> CW delivered for us this week. Mm -hmm. What an episode. Like, I don't know. I watched this with the premiere together and I couldn't wait for you guys to watch it. And I couldn't wait for the world to watch it because it's just an incredible episode. Yeah. What do you guys think? I'm sad. <laughs> yeah. I think I that know. seems like I'm, the consensus. I know, I'm just so sad. I was devastated by the end. Like, I was having, a, like, I really enjoyed the episode. I was having a little problem with the teens because I wasn't sure where we were going. And then I was like, Sabrina, just let them be teenagers. And and I was fun. so frustrated, though, because, like, didn't... <sighs> Warning, I'm getting back into the Jordan and Sarah of it all. <laughs> um, didn't he he was like i'm just trying to give you space and she's like you don't need to give me space and i was like girl what did you just say to him at his birthday party <laughs> isn't that what we were i was so confused with her and then by the end of the episode she was like i don't know they were like she was like fighting for his honor which was kind of cute and he was wearing her flannel and that freaking bully i was like can you shut up like what they're having fun uh but i was glad that they left that was good mm -hmm. i just got way ahead of everything but no no i feel fun. like this, this is such an unfamiliar <laughs> episode it's good to start with familiar territory um yeah i agree i feel like that was i'm very happy with where the teens went in that story because it, it was so fun and i said last week i teased that that uh seeing all four of those ca characters together always makes for such a good time and that's exactly what we got um Maybe they had to force it a little quickly to get Sarah and Jordan back on the same page. But can I just say, I thought she was very, very mean to him at the start when she just like ran out on him when he was trying to, well, I know he was having that embarrassing moment, but it was just like, that's the, like Reed said, that's the exact opposite of the messages she's been giving him. Sometimes she's like, let's be friends. Other times she's like, she needs space. Clearly that was a, a, I need space moment. And then she followed that up with, you don't need to give me space. And I'm like, it's frustrating. Like I'm, I can't really fault the character because, I don't know. It, that kind of rings true. Like, teenagers are kind of wishy-washy. They change their minds a lot. But I'm like, and this is what I would have said last week had I been on the pod, is just like, I wish they would, the writers, the writing would take the character in a different direction. Mm -hmm. I don't think these two characters always need to be the center of each other's universe or like the conflict. I don't know. I just, I'm hoping for something a little bit different because I feel like we keep getting the same conversation between them in like different fonts. <laughs> That's a good like, I, I'm, I don't know which one to like believe anymore. And then, and then it makes me lose interest. And I feel like for me, the stake in those characters plummets when I'm like, I feel like we had that conversation before and it's just in reverse now. I, think I don't know. Is that unfair? No, I think so what you said about how they don't need to be the center of each other's universes, I feel like that's how they want Sarah to feel 
but then she also really wants to hang out with Jordan. Like she wants to be able to like hang out with Natalie and not have to bring him along. But then like, if he's around, she wants him to be around. And I was like, would a teenager be able to explain that feeling? Probably not because adults can't even explain that feeling. But I, I wish it was better executed because I think her complicated emotions around what she wants from Jordan is realistic. It's just coming off like whiplash. Um, I was actually very happy that when he came to the party, she didn't immediately assume he followed her mm, because yeah. um, typically with their dynamic, that's what would have happened. And then they would have gotten prickly in the middle of the party and then he would have gotten his feelings hurt. And then she would have said something mean. And then Natalie would have had to tell her that like, he probably just arrived here not knowing that you were here or something. I'm glad we completely avoided that entire situation and they were able to have a another nice conversation about her wanting to be friends with him which is something that she's never wanted from her exes before and I think this time Jordan really was just trying to be a friend there was nothing like romantic he was like I didn't I didn't bring you a gift from Malaysia this time (laughs) (laughs) well even when he was asking after her in in the diner he really was even though it was awkward was just trying to ask her what she was up to which is what a friend would ask like it wasn't him trying to slide his self into whatever she was doing with Natalie he kind of just wanted to talk to her maybe mm-hmm. after this whole we bonded over potentially fake beer ball not really sure what was in those cups because I think she said something about water but who knows mm-hmm. um maybe we've gotten to a point where we can be besties I kind of didn't want them to be quite besties just yet even though like the energy it's quick yeah it very quick but I will say that scene between the two of them where they like laughed before they played the game with the bullies. Um, that was my favorite scene between the two of them since season one. And you saw how like they, they, those two actors have such great chemistry together, regardless they of do. what dynamic they're in. Um, and it, that was probably arguably maybe my favorite scene of them ever. Season one made them so fresh, fun and like lovable. I was so invested in the relationship and season two did the opposite. I was worried that season three was going down the same route. But if we have more scenes like this, I don't care what the relationship is, as long as they just get on with each other. But I do agree. It was like whiplash going from the last episode into this one. It was very, very quick. I feel like they don't need to talk about their whatever their relationship is anymore. Just be in it. Do something yeah. else. Yeah. Like I yeah. can't. I can't handle any more conversations about what they are to each other. (laughs) We got it. You figured it out. I think you're good now (laughs) for a few more episodes. Well, especially because it's so cute. Like, I did love that he was in her flannel and she was was such a rubber girl, right? She's like this petite thing, but she's very much like, what? (laughs) You would be like, you stuff to her friends. And I love that. That's the Sarah I want to see. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah, hopefully she sticks around and we aren't given a blush in episode four. I also like that um, John was trying to be like a good boyfriend, but also having weirdness with his ex, who I'm not sure why she's decided she wants to get back with him now. Mm-hmm. Um, but that whole, as if, I don't love this for John, but I like seeing John interact with someone who's not really his friend, um, but like trying to saying goodbye to his old life while protecting his new life and then ditching homegirl. When he was like, you know what? This doesn't service me. And I love how much this show is like, no, friends can go above and beyond for you. It doesn't have to be romantic. Because when she was like, oh, but you traveled all the way to Metropolis for me. And he was like, yeah, because we're friends. I wanted to see you. Like, I love that. I love that it didn't have to be an underlying, oh, I still secretly like you. And I only came all the way because I, all the way over here because I wanted to see if there was something between us. He was like, no, we're, we're, we're friends. I like, I, I wanted to hang out. I would come all the way to Metropolis to see my friend. Yeah, there was an innocence to that, which was nice. And I think that was, John sometimes gets like lost in everyone else's story. And I'm glad he kind of had this moment. It's, I don't know where they're going with that. Cause he was obviously, he was completely caught off guard and it's, Eliza is quite an important character to the show because she was involved in the first season off screen. She was his first girlfriend and then she broke up with him and she made him hate Smallville even more. So it's an interesting choice to bring her back now, let alone cast her. So I, I don't know whether we'll see her again, if this will play into his relationship with Candace, who practically doesn't exist to the show. So I don't know what, what the stakes are there. But either way, I'm happy to see John John get some storylines and human storylines and not get lost in the, the midst of all the superhero stuff going on. Um, Again, Michael Bishop, great performance. He's really, really made himself at home on the show very, very quickly. 
Um, but yeah, I just I like seeing the four of them together because there's less conversations between Jordan and Sarah, more dynamics between like Sarah and Natalie, Sarah getting to be badass, and then Jonathan Jonathan getting some spotlight as well. It was an interesting balance, balancing that with the seriousness of the episode. I think this is the most different episode Superman and Lois has ever done. And it was quite jarring going at the, the longer each storyline went on. The Lois one got more serious and this one got more fun. But I think maybe they just needed that little bit of levity and it worked in the long run. Can we talk about Lois? Yeah. Rip the bandaid off. Uh, did, we, did we have to rip the bandaid off? Because like, <laughs> I was like, I struggled to laugh tweet afterwards. Like, I assumed it was going to be cancer, and yet I still felt punched in the gut yeah. when she finally said it. And I think, one, a credit to Betty Tulloch's performance. Like, it was heart-wrenching seeing her give up a piece of herself to help the judge um, come off the ledge when she was going to commit suicide. But also seeing Clark up there, hearing for the yeah. first time that his wife has an aggressive form of cancer or cancer period, but also an aggressive form of cancer and having to fly there. He's just hovering, listening. And in that moment, like he can't go to her, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's in that moment, Superman. Oh, so heart wrenching. I think that was probably the most, one of the best performances either one of them have given because obviously Bitsy was so powerful and Tyler was so subtle. Mm -hmm. And just the two of them together. And then that hug with the music and the slow-mo camera zoom such such a beautiful moment and it was so like heart-wrenching but i feel like there were three particular standout moments of the episode the the opening montage where like lois got her results and it was not a single word of dialogue was said and bitsy just looked at the camera before the logo came on incredible you knew like that was like hbo drama right there just human drama that made you really feel something of course the scene where lois uh i talked to the, the judge off the ledge quite literally while clark watched but my god the final scene of the episode People. i uh, well, when i first watched that on a friday night oh i sat in darkness for a long time after that and just processed it like what a you moment you know when they cut the dialogue audio mm -hmm. and they slow it down a little bit it <sighs> No matter how many times I see a scene like that on television, it hits every time. Mm -hmm. It it just is a wallop. I don't even know if that's a word, but it is. <laughs> yeah. It just punches you right in the gut, and you feel it. And my God, I, you're, if there are the biggest spitzy stands in the world, it's the three of us. I think. Yeah, like that. I the Emmys. Wake up. <laughs> yes she's like you see them at the table and you just know it's like the stomach just drops along with it and the boys know and she's sitting there and I was like mom's about to say something that is gonna be like world changing mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened and it's just I love the effect of taking dialogue out right and just mm -hmm. letting it be like the the, the instrumental and because we know, face work, we know, you know, and I think it's because it also feels that way when you're given bad news, right? Like if you, you hear like what Susan said, but you're kind of, you're there, but not there. Your and so it stops. It feels like an out of body experience. Yeah. It, and then, so to see like the boys here and then immediately go hug their mom, mm -hmm. you know, because like, that's the reaction you would have. And then Clark trying to keep it together, but clearly falling apart to the side yeah. and I was like so y'all gonna hurt us hurt us this season like it's just truly going to be like should I have tissues beside me because yeah. I feel like I'm gonna need them I've never yeah. seen like well, I guess I have but like the way that they were able to effectively compose on screen just that moment where your life change changes mm -hmm. like after that moment even though Lois knew and then Clark knew a little bit after she did her processing in that moment, their lives aren't the same and the way that they were able to execute that on screen and make us all feel that, even if that's not the exact situation that we've been in. Like, I think we've all had that moment where like you're told information or you read something and you're like, so life is different now. And you're mm -hmm. like, it just is like, I don't know where to go from here. Um, yeah, I thought it was really beautiful. It was. It was. And the fact is, like, from a scripting standpoint, you know, you're not supposed to relay information more than once. So, of course, the fact that they, they didn't need that dialogue where Lois followed up afterwards. But I, I, like you guys said, I just think it was so effective that 
after she said those words to them, I have cancer. It did, they wouldn't have heard anything after that as characters. Everything else would have been drawn out because like Reed said, your, their lives were immediately different. And the, the, the slow turning down of the dialogue and the st- slow turning up of the music just as they got up to hug her. It was just such a powerful scene and all four in the, in, of the cast members in that scene were just incredible. And they, then that final, like, I thought that was probably the most authentic scene in the episode, just that final close up on uh, Lois, just as she put her head against Jonathan, I think. But like Jordan was holding on so, so tight as well. It was just so beautiful. And like, like you said, like Emmys wake up. Um, I I think that's just probably the most powerful scene. I'm perhaps even the superhero genre has ever done um, because the show always tries outside the box things, but just part of you never thought they'd do a storyline like this and to do it so effectively in just a 40 minute period so far. And I know this is not going to, obviously that would be t- distasteful to have it as an episode of the week or, it's, or a subplot. This is going to be the family focused storyline of the season. And I, I I, I'm excited just to, for them to raise awareness about this kind of thing because television is such a powerful medium and I'm not worried about the fact that oh it's a comic book show or oh it's a superhero show or there's superpowers or a supervillain involved in this I have no doubt the show will handle this and raise awareness for it expertly and I have no doubt that Bitsy will continue to deliver phenomenal performances because I tell you I, I love everything about the show but after that episode heard, I, I cried after that scene that was just such a powerful scene and I can't wait to see where it goes next, just, just from a performance standpoint, from a raising awareness standpoint. It's going to be probably a difficult watch because the show will handle it authentically. But like, if it's anything like that scene, I just, I, I, I that will stay with me for a long time. I just thought it was such a beautiful, beautiful episode. But more than that, such a beautiful scene, that closing, in, closing moment. Mm-hmm. I do want to say though, for those who are going to be tuning in to the rest of the season, because this has been described as the villain of season three her our diagnosis and then of course having to combat cancer uh it's gonna be trying like they they have been very open and honest about what Lois is going to be going through so like take care of yourselves yeah like mm-hmm. if it if it's a lot for you um maybe have someone who watches the show with you tell you what her storyline is going to be in an episode before you decide to watch uh mm-hmm. because it is they are leaning full tilt into what it's like watching someone you love go through uh, a fight with cancer. Um, and it is it is part of Lois's journey. It's not the only thing that she's doing because just like in real life, you have, like she's still a mom. Like she's still an investigative journalist. She has cancer and she, she is fighting against that, but her life is not stopping. Um, so it's balancing her fight with what she wants to do. And we are going to see that. And that's going to be very difficult. So like, just take care of yourselves. Yes. And I think that's what Superman at Lois is going to do very well in that. Uh, what Yes, Lois Lane is going to continue reporting and bring down the bad guy of the season and Bruno Mannheim. But on the other front, I think the most effective thing that this show is, can do is show the little things that a real person de- battling an illness like this would still have to do, like be a mom, be a wife, um, go to work every day of the week. I just think the normal things is what Superman at Lois does so well. And I feel like we're going to continue to see that. And that's an important part of the storyline, especially for someone like Lois going through this to see how, how it not just impacts her work, how it impacts her fight to take down a bad guy, but how it impacts just her normal everyday life. And I've no doubt the show will like spotlight that beautifully. And it's going to change all of their worldviews too. Like, like Clark still has to be Superman and, mm-hmm. and fight the tangible villains. Mm-hmm. Like the villains that he can see because like he can't do anything to save Lois, but at the end of the day, he still has to, you know, fight Bruno, Onomatopoeia. Mm-hmm. What are they? Well, who are they? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but there's a couple now, right? Yeah. Or are they the same person? Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a couple. I think that's the interesting thing because the premiere kind of showed that uh, Bruno Mannheim was the person in charge, but this episode suggests that maybe he listens to Onomatopoeia as the uh, I instead. I love that word, by the way. It's yeah. so fun. <laughs> it's <laughs> excellent. <laughs> and it makes total sense because the villain's powers is that it can literally create sounds that sound like sounds so like in the comic book he would snap an arrow and say snap at the same time so like this is exactly what Superman at Lois version is more of like a paranormal supernatural version so that they can affect Superman. So I don't know whether Bruno Mannheim answers to Onomatopoeia, Onomatopoeia answers to Bruno Mannheim, but there's a, it's such a 
interesting partnership. And we saw in this episode how she went out and uh, attacked, of course, the mayor, RIP Georgia Dean, um, how she went out and then attacked Lana as well. Sorry, the former mayor and then the actual mayor. And then now she has history with John Henry Iron. She was the one who killed him. So I feel like we've just scratched the surface with both of those characters. And I'm intrigued to see what role they kind of play in each other's endgame and who's really the boss. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, especially because like Bruno is having like this philosophical verbal battle with Superman. I don't know if we're going to continue to have those moments between them. Like Clark is dealing with a lot at home, mm-hmm. but also I have to stand here and listen to you tell me how I have failed an entire region of Metropolis. I thought that um, I thought that discussion was interesting because I was listening to Bruno and I was like, Bruno, what did you want him to do about like things that he has no control over? Um, and I had tweeted this too because I was like. Superman is a a first responder, (laughs) okay, like, you wanted funds for the neighborhood and for the crime to be cleaned up in an effective way, and I was like, it's not his job, it's not what Superman does, we are the, like, we're the global firefighter, I don't expect my, like, firehouse to clean up the streets, like, so I just (laughs) don't, I just don't see where Bruno was going with that, I mean, I get, you know, being like, you're the world's hero, but you weren't the hero of what my neighborhood needed. I'm the hero. But I was also like, you are resurrecting people from the dead. And you did give mm-hmm. someone powers. He, 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 like, you, he's like, you come here and you accuse me. He's like, but you did do it. To the crime that you committed. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's what's going to make him a very effective villain because, yeah, it's, there are holes in the story. And But a lot of what he said made sense. His neighborhood needed more and there weren't, was no one willing to give it to him. Maybe he wanted that from Superman and Superman couldn't give it to him. But at the end of the day, he, he's going to be highlighted as something of probably a corrupt kind of political figure because he is whatever the hero his neighborhood needs. But like Sabrina said, at the same time, he's responsible for killing people and bringing them back from the dead and then killing them again. So we don't know what his end goal is here. But I think there's definitely layers to this character and I've seen a lot of people who are more familiar with the comic book version saying this is one of the best versions of the character they've ever seen whereas in the comics he's more cheesy and one one note so we've got a lot of depth here which is what Superman at Lois does best and it was a, it was a very powerful scene the conversation the two of them shared even if Bruno was quite hypocritical but like Chad L. Coleman such presence again he appears in like two scenes an episode and you do not forget those scenes love him love him love him I've never seen anyone dismiss Superman like that, though. Yeah. Like, he summoned him there, and then he dismissed him and told him never to come to, into his home again. I was like, but you called him as like the the power of that, where Clark just has to listen. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I like that Bruno got to say what he had to say, even if I don't completely agree with everything that Bruno was talking about. But I'm like, oh, this is an interesting. Like, this is how you effectively use a monologue from a villain to a superhero who really can't say, like the superhero, Clark couldn't really say anything because Bruno's right in the sense that he did not help them. He was not mm-hmm. the hero they needed. Like you can't just respond, like it, it wouldn't behoove Clark to go, but like, but that's not my job. Like then you just sound terrible. So mm-hmm. he has to stand there and take, well, float there and take it. Um, and, but I do wonder, because we haven't talked about Natalie yet in full capacity with the young man that she was speaking to, um, at the party, which I love their little cute back and forth, as awkward as it was, it it was like true to form. Like that's exactly how those conversations would go at their age. But I wonder if he's Bruno's son or charge mm. or something, because uh, Sarah did say, which, but she was specifically talking about the person who was throwing the party. It could be like a Romeo and Juliet situation, but like without all the death. And she wasn't speaking about that young man, but I'm like, mm, but we never call Romeo and Juliet into the plot unless we're going to actually service a Romeo, Romeo and Juliet-esque plot. And that boy is really into Natalie. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he saw her once in the hallway when, and was like hoping she'd come back. That's a good point. So now have, I wonder. have to go somewhere with that. But yeah, because like at the end, it, why, the Lois and uh, Sarah and the kids' storylines were so like jarringly different, but notice they both ended up in Metropolis at the same time. Like, Jordan and Jonathan were in Metropolis at the same time as their parents were um, for two completely different storylines. It makes you wonder if they are connected after all, because they have to be going somewhere with that. I know Natalie at the end of the day still feels very much lost in this new world. And then that was another beautiful scene to highlight that because it reminded us of the time she left Metropolis High. But at the same time, I don't think they just brought Mateo into it for no reason, especially since Sarah or she was it she was like to Sarah or Sarah was like, there are other people out there. Or there are other guys out there. Nah, I th- I don't think this is the last we've seen of him. 
Mm-hmm. Especially because the actor is actually from, like, he played on All American. So it's one of those, yeah. we seeded a familiar CW face into a show. And um, he had a, a big part in All American for multiple seasons. So it's not like, I don't think this is a one off. Mm-hmm. There's more to it than that. Mm-hmm. Intrigued by um, season three of Superman and Lois, and we're only two episodes in. Yeah, incredible episode. Very much so. But we have to move to Horseshoe Bay. Uh, what going on in Horseshoe Bay? Yeah, there very is, much. But I have to say, I was disappointed it wasn't an A state. Like, I really, when they mm. showed George, I was like, oh, girl, did you crash it? Because I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but george was picking up on the vibes mm-hmm. she was because yeah when ace was cleaning the windshield <laughs> and well, i don't remember what nancy said but she looked out at ace and george was like oh, i saw that yeah i think she said i have people in horseshoe bay and then she was yeah. like, just staring at ace yeah my, would like, you say my people in horseshoe bay or something yeah, yeah, oh yeah my people ace. are in horseshoe bay possessiveness of my yeah <laughs> I, I i when i first saw that scene i was like oh such a such a growthful moment for nancy because like sh- in season one it was just her these people might help her but she did not like acknowledge them and i was like oh she's finally acknowledged them as their people and then there was that like just like that glance to ask and i was like are you acknowledging your people or your person and then Ooh, uh, the I fact, like that. <laughs> and the fact that he kind of looked back at her as well like at the end of the day um uh Nancy Drew has been very subtle with the Nace references, but that wasn't subtle. And I think we can say that nothing about season three has been subtle so far, especially in the next episode, which we'll get to. But like, oh, even though it wasn't a Nace death, the Nace crumbs were there. I can't even crawl them crumbs at this point. It was a meal because they were also touching more than they typically do. There was no reason for her to pull him back from that door that was closing in whatever that abandoned building was. But we were clutching. And I was like, oh, it's like, okay. (laughs) clocking it i see we are ramping up this like physicality and i'm here for it mm-hmm. was this the episode two where nancy falls off the ledge yeah mm-hmm. okay yeah she falls off the ledge and i was like ace is never gonna let this girl fall <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't <laughs> no and then she like like rested on him for a second or right beside him i feel like the only reason george was there was to observe she george was us she was notching the nest moments like i see what you're doing and um, i feel like that was the only reason she was there um because like there were a lot to observe and and like okay they kind of died out when they got to Detective Con which is what the episode was all about it was an interesting structured episode the way we had like two mini plots within a, a, one episode but like as far as they were in that factory lots of nice moments to say I I have to say I never tire of the trope where like oh we fell and we're on top of each other and it's a weird <laughs> moment like I lo- no matter how many times I see it, like it's in every romantic comedy, I feel like. <laughs> like it for to me, it never gets old. And we needed a nice one. And off the checklist check, we did it. <laughs> it is fantastic. I think what's also great though is they end the episode together. Um, they're the last two at Detective yeah. Con, which I'm just gonna jump forward just a bit because I just think it's interesting that those two are the last two. Um and we get the full story of what happened to I believe the man's name was Joe. And it turns out to be a love story. And I was like, hmm, two people that probably are going, well, not probably, we kind of know what happens in season <laughs> three, <laughs> that, are, that are going to end up together, are together listening to a love story that transcended race and has transcended time. So I'm just I truly, I didn't see that reveal coming because I mm-hmm. feel like I missed something along the way of the what was his name Joe Joe Cal- 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 Kelsey Kelsey Joe Kelsey yeah. I feel like I missed something early on and when they were piecing together like that he was innocent I was confused about what the ghost was showing them <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't I I I think I don't know maybe it was it, I, it's definitely a me problem it wasn't the show like I think I missed something or I missed a detail and I was kind of like I don't know where this is going I don't fully understand the mission but I trust Nancy to get me there and she got me there at the end mm-hmm. um, but yeah I was like confused with the, the whole episode of that story but I love how they always give Ace the like the I don't want to say funny but it's usually funny because it's ace they give him like the different voices to do like he was um george's great aunt or something Mm -hmm. like that was kind of funny like they always give it to ace and it's his physicality as with the 
the way the ghost was like haunting him from the inside and he's just like in the chair <laughs> he's like yeah I'm, i'll just stay here <laughs> fighting for his life <laughs> I think with Joe, it's the, um, it was confusing, but I think it's more so because they've never dealt with a ghost who was trying to lie to you about what happened because mm -hmm. he's stuck in the moment of the crime that he did not commit. So he's trying to hide it in order to protect um, the podcaster's grandmother. Uh, I thought, I was like, oh, this story is very, it's heartbreaking, but it's also very sweet. And I do love that you have that one moment where, um, when she's sitting next to him, Ace is fine. So it's like they're they're alluding to it because when she hands him the cookies, he is actually better. I mean, he's better because Joe feels good being around the woman that he loved. So mm -hmm. they're just sitting there and he's like, and Ace was like, why do I feel better? And it's, like, it's not the cookies. <laughs> it's her. <laughs> it all came together really nicely. And I think it, by the end of the episode, when we'll talk about that, we talk about how like... Uh, Nancy helped solve another murder or the, got caught the killer but at the end of the day they solved another one as well even though it was they didn't do anything about it but they figured this they, they, they handled the two like storylines together quite well like there was a lot to do considering we had two different locations too many episodes and two storylines the show managed to ha handle it all quite well and I agree I do like the fact it ended with a big like nest reveal while the two of them the, the thing they do best is be like detectives together of course we know the storyline's going somewhere but they were very much at the heart of why this mystery got solved. And that was such a powerful end. And, um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that I love how this episode managed to juggle so much, including catching who we believe, or at least thought was the frozen hearts killer. I love that. Um, I, I always love being duped by this show. Like Nancy's like, Oh, I'm going to go to my car. And I'm like, why did you take that route to go to your yeah. car? Nancy, <laughs> the decision-making isn't, you know, great today. But when she opens the door and it's the cops, I'm like, ah, I never, I can't, I, I always doubt Nancy, but she's always three <laughs> steps ahead of me. <laughs> but the podcaster, I thought it was so funny. This isn't a drag. It was just, you know, my thoughts while watching it. Um, When she, Nancy gives her the box of things that are from Beth, <laughs> and, but she won't let go of it until she, the podcaster, Lacey, yeah. gives up the name of the frozen hearts killer but previously to that she didn't want to publicly state the name but here they are in this room there's people behind nancy and she's just like it, there's i could hear the echo i'm like these people in the room can hear you <laughs> <laughs> you're not whispering the identity of the killer <laughs> i just thought it was funny like unimportant like low-hanging fruit yeah but i'm watching that scene and i'm like girl <laughs> you're See, practically I yelling it out loud <laughs> Oh, like, man. what if he was in the room and he was like, yeah, oh. <laughs> she knows, let me leave. I will not stay around. Yeah. But that was a big reveal when we found out he was in the room, because I know I I, I have a vague idea of the season that the frozen horse killer storyline is going to go on for at least the majority of the season. So when we find out that he was there with them and then I was like, oh, this is getting very episodic, like they're going to suddenly tie it up. And then they did tie it up, only they didn't tie it up. So much going on. And it's like like Reed said, they, they love to pull the wool over her eye so many times and so effective. It was. I love also how they decide to catch him, the the plan um, that really is sort of even a bait and switch for the audience. But Nancy being on a hot mic, being like, he's a loser. He's <laughs> terrible. He's she, messy. <laughs> she called that man out. Yes. <laughs> and they were like in the audience trying to find him and they get the, they find, they see the sketchy guy and I'm like, oh God, not this serial killer being hot. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's the guy it's the 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 planted guy with the sandwich coupon or whatever <laughs> i was like thank the lord like i i can't thirst over a serial killer in the show <laughs> oh man but that was i, a good... I was i was worried in that moment i was like oh no <laughs> uh, i i did not think that man was making it out of there and then thank goodness that wasn't him but then the real serial killer didn't make it out of there either um but I, I, I did. I laughed so hard at that because they threw in that silly line of dialogue when they were all there. If you catch the real serial killer, you get the prize or whatever. And then they went and caught the fake serial killer. That was so effective. Um, but then they went and caught the real one. Um, 
Yeah, this episode pivoted so much between like lightheartedness and like darkness. Very, very, very seamless. Like, like even like yes, or like Reed's head with the yes physical comedy. While, while this man was possessed and practically dying and burning from the inside out. But sure, let's have some time so we can do all these strange movements and like get up and fall over. Alex, who plays yes, great physical actor, but just mm-hmm. generally, he so is. But just everything about this episode was just, I love this episode, I have to say. It, yeah. On paper, it was very like standalone, but it wasn't. Yeah. Somehow they always balance these episodes with the, it's always so traumatic. The, the, when they uncover like these cases, and it's like, this one was really heavy and deep. But we also got the levity of George finding out she's a, low-key celebrity at detective con because her sister is writing fanfic <laughs> like <laughs> it, it was also like cute and everything comes around full circle into a way that just it feels like a, a hug at the end of it which is necessary after you get into the into these mysteries that are so deeply seated in generational trauma constantly i don't know how they do it Mm -hmm. i don't know either because it it still turns out being like heartwarming even after like you're like yes it's tragic what happened to jill but then you hear um lacy lacy right Uh, lacy's grandmother talk about her relationship with joe and how like they would meet at the they would meet at the motel and they had to hide their relationship and little history drop about how it was is um decades before loving versus virginia so they could not yeah. be together um i was like oh my god i like how am i, I like i love them so much and then when they showed when i love how they both just accept that his ghost appears i was like yes just <laughs> accept it because he's saying that <laughs> like, but like when the, the match strikes and they get to see him and he's gonna pass on now and she has closure and i'm just like this is so beautiful and like and it was only five minutes worth of story it was, it was such a ghost whisperer moment. i was gonna say they completely i feel like most ghost whisper episodes are like the ghost isn't here you're crazy what are you talking about but like i like sabrina said like they just accept it and i was like thank you (laughs) (laughs) thank you i mean i I guess seeing him still young kind of did that for them but i know it's like it's okay for Nancy and all of her ones to accept that ghosts are real but I was like these people accepted ghosts very very quickly but like you said I guess it's because we saw him but yeah very ghost this moment he didn't quite walk into the light so much as he just like turned to dust but that's Nancy's way of doing it very effective and it was a nice moment in what was an otherwise quite dark but funny episode mm-hmm. I'm still on the aces of the hardy boy <laughs> train. like they ended with the two of them and her telling him that she's missed something because the killer said that there's um that it's bigger than him mm-hmm. and i was like i'm hearing you nancy but also i'm looking at you and ace and i'm getting nancy jew in hardy boy vibes i wonder and i didn't think of this until this moment um kind of jumping ahead to episode four i wonder if this is connected somehow Maybe not, because we haven't talked about the plot of episode four yet. But Ace is still involved in this Bobsy mess. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, like, how big this goes. I don't know. I'm nervous about it. I'm very nervous about the whatever's happened with those chocolates. (laughs) (laughs) Because there's no real explanation um for it i mean the da goes in to like the case and what they're trying to track down but i was like ace best warned you and now we're caught up i loved how Bess's vibe in three and four was like i told you all this i said what i said no one listened to me if you listen to me and i'm like go pop off mm-hmm. Bess. yeah <laughs> yeah but <laughs> he said that he felt like she was mothering him and i was like well you know what ace she needed to. Yes. <laughs> and she agreed. She immediately says that next. You needed it. <laughs> and you still needs it. <laughs> but I feel like I, I Bess was well within her rights to react like that. I will say um, sometimes Nancy subverts expectations. I thought they maybe went a little bit of the predictable route that people suddenly started treating Bess a little disrespectfully out of the blow. So, but uh, regardless, it worked nonetheless. She she absolutely deserved to have that reaction because uh 
they were ignoring her, they were leaving her out. And she was right. She had that feeling. That was more subtle in the previous episode. She had that feeling that they all just kind of abandoned her. And you did feel for her when like even then Nick went out to the youth centre and that she was just left in the claw on what seemed was it a day off. I don't know. The, the claw was quiet and she was just on her own. So I, I do, I appreciate where she's coming from. Not entirely sure she's well within her rights, sir, to be working with um temperance and saying, eh, she's not so bad. But oh yeah, that is yeah. like there's smoke. Yeah. And there's gonna be a fire, I feel like. Yeah. And I wouldn't even mind, because you know I love a little bit of mess, if they went the like Buffy season six dark willow route with Bess, where yes. like she clearly has some sort of power. She's tapped into something within her or temperance is teaching her how to access that. And sometimes when you wield power, heavy is the head that wears the crown. And she might be like, she might go a little too far. <laughs> and I would I'd love to see that where you where they need to reel her back in after she's like on her high horse now. Cause she's been, she was the one that saved them this time. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know if that's a first, she's definitely been a team player. Um, which she does say like, she's like, I've, was that her? Where she was like, I've helped all of these things. Like I can do this. Um, but like seeing her come into her own and be the one that's like, I'm going to save y'all on the stream and I'm going to kill this person because guess what? My new friend, you might like my problematic queen is teaching me how to be <laughs> magic. <laughs> she had a very craft, the craft moment where we're yeah. like calling the clouds and the lightning. I do think you're right. She might end up power tripping because she struck a, a ghost with lightning on her own. Like after like getting Ryan to place the crowbar, like a, a lightning rod there. And I was like, oh, best I'm into it. But also best, I do want you to slow down and listen to what Nancy said. Mm -hmm. Because last pod, when Michael and I were talking about magic, I had said there's a cost to it. Nancy said today in that episode, sorry, um, is there's a cost to it. Best is not thinking about the cost I was like, girl you have to give something back to magic you can't just keep yeah. taking from it mm -hmm. it will take from you and they've learned that lesson before and I loved you guys you mentioned uh once upon a time yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's always a price it reminds me too of shadow and bone because like once Alina comes into her magic and she gets the amplifiers at least <clears throat> excuse me at least in the books she continues to want more, 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 more. It feels good to be powerful. Like I want more. Mm -hmm. And she, they get to that line where I could cross it and wield way too much power or I could keep resisting this thing. And I think it'll be a, a bumpy ride for Bess. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. And Madison was so good. In oh, it was an incredible moment. And I was so happy for Bess that she, I kind of wanted to stay with it a little longer because suddenly as soon as she did the big witchy moment, it was over. But like, I just, I just wanted us to stand and appreciate the grandeur of Bess. But I also do worry that it'll end up a bit like the parasite route and even like Superman and Lois with Ollie Austin, you saw the same. The more power they get, the more the more the more they want. And the only way of stopping them is to overload them with that power. And then they're like, well, bad idea. Um so I hope it doesn't go that route. But I do, I wonder if it'll be that she goes on kind of like a power trip now and I don't necessarily mean that in a physical kind of way because she did say at the end that we everyone needs to take my idea seriously as much as Nancy's and while I do appreciate that the reason the Drew crew always works is that Nancy is the leader everybody else does things that Nancy can't but she's always she's the detective among them she's the one that gets things done I, I, the reason I love the Drew crew more than I love Team Flash is because everyone's like, oh, Team Flash, everybody's the leader. And they're like, no, the Flash is the leader. Everybody else needs to play their roles. And I just don't worry now that Bess might, the power might go to her head. And that uh, if if Nancy has a good idea, she, now she'll be like, I'm not doing that. And you should have listened to me before. So listen to me now. She was right in the situation and she deserved to be listened to and they treated her with such disrespect. But I don't want it to get to the case where she starts clashing with everybody else's good ideas, if that makes sense. Because we did see in previous seasons, Bess can be a little bit impulsive as well. And she's, um, she can be vulnerable. And when you're vulnerable, you can be easy to be preyed upon. So I think temperance will also take advantage of that. Although Bess does have kind of a, a new girl in her life. Yeah. Addie. Addie. Is her name? Mm -hmm. So she's, I feel like we're going to see not a love triangle, but like she's going to be in the middle of this, hopefully, or maybe not. I don't know. But I also love the dynamic too, between Bess and Ryan when they're like, yeah. <laughs> uh giddy over i watched it like three times because it was so funny um whatever they say when bess is gonna they plan to save them from their dreams 
I don't know, their di- their dynamic being like giddy little kids together. Like Bess finally found someone who's like at her level. <laughs> <laughs> And it was so cute. I just, I also too, we've been standing Ryan pretty hard for the past few episodes. Um, but just seeing him in Nick's youth center, I'm like, he's healing his inner child. And I, my heart swelled up. Like, I was like, this is like, sometimes you can see like the maneuvers in the writing. We're like, oh, we created this new set and this character really has nothing to do. Let's just pop him in. But it feels so natural and organic mm-hmm. that he needs to he needs to find a purpose outside of his name outside of his family and his life has been so guarded and and horrible like being around these terrible uh old money dynamics and being able to find a part of him that had been suppressed beyond his own um decision making you could just see the lightness come out of Ryan now, even when he's, you know, poking fun at Carson too and getting to spend time with Nancy. So there's my standing Ryan moment for the episode. <laughs> no, I totally agree. Like with the moment at the end, I didn't expect him to get so emotional over it so quickly, which was such a like, oh, Ryan. Um, Like when Nick said that uh, they thought the world of you and that they talk to you and they see you as a pair, it meant so much to him because, of course, we we Nick said this so much about how the kids need someone, but we didn't. I don't think we all realized how much Ryan needed something, how Ryan needed a calling, and it's been very much played for laughs until this point. But you saw how much it meant to him, how much he wants to change, how much he wants to grow, and how he may finally have found his purpose. And then some the the reputation of being a bad person when you're surrounded by bad people doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. And I think we're really starting to see Ryan flourish as a person now without any negative influences around him. And I can't wait to see where that goes. It's such a subtle storyline and probably won't get the forefront of anything. But just as Ryan stands, I just I, I want the best for him and I can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah, well, he doesn't deserve to have a, a bad reputation by yeah. proxy. So No, I mean, he did deserve some of it. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he does. Yeah. But yeah. like, toward the end, it was clear that he ha- he didn't, he wasn't involved in the Hudson <laughs> yeah. family crime ring. <laughs> That's true. But I, what I love about the moment between him and Nick is that there seems to be a subtle acknowledgement that at risk tends to be class-based, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Like mm-hmm. Ryan was an at-risk youth. Yes, he had a lot of money, but he was neglected and it made him act out. And no, he didn't end up in prison, but that's by virtue of having very powerful parents. Like it's his circumstances that kept him out of trouble, not necessarily his actions, right? So mm-hmm. I just think that he can bond with these kids because he too know what knows what it's like to have parents who aren't really there for you or treat you like an obligation or to feel unheard or not to be given for your ideas to be given anyway and he's like sitting crisscross applesauce eating cookies with these kids like hey what's up and like we're just and just listening to them um and they that's what they need and that's exactly what um Nick's youth center is for which is why you know not that I wished Jake ill but the fact I think it's poetic that he ended up being heartless because he was heartless in life. Very much. You so. want to hear my reaction? I have a I have a soundbite queued up. Yes. <laughs> my reaction. Here's my reaction. Let me make sure my volume's up before I do this because that would be embarrassing. Here we go. This way. Oh. Mm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't care. <laughs> Didn't care. <laughs> Pop off. <laughs> I literally did that. I was like, oh, oh, all right. <laughs> his, his heart's been taken. Okay. I mean, this is a man who went to the police station to complain about 12 year olds' bikes being locked up at his um, establishment. I mean, should Nick get a bike rack of his own? Sure. But so that's a conversation to just walk over with. Like, can can we store the yeah. bikes over here? Like, um, instead of at the cafe, it doesn't allow those patrons to be able to put their bikes if they want it. Instead, he was like, let's get the law enforcement involved. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love Nancy being all cheerful. I'll talk to him for you just to take the thing off. But uh, at the same time, I thought, thought that it was very clever the way he was seated into the episode because when Nancy threw the pot at his head, it missed and it was turned into such a big, like both comedic, but also OMG, what did you do kind of moment. When she walked away, he looked after a little like um cautious, a little worried, a little concerned after she left. And at the time I thought it was because... um. 
he was afraid that she did know Necker, that she had turned against him or that the law that he was trying to use wasn't working with him. But now in hindsight, you can see, no, the reason he did that was because he knew what was going on because he was clearly being haunted by the same entity that she was. So um, I just feel like maybe he was seeing that his heart was taken out or whatever. But at the, I, I feel like I love the fact that the Sandman was seemed to be targeting anybody and it made what it was kind of like a bottle episode because everybody was in the same place at the same time but it was spreading you know the way i said i hate about the flash when things are go all this exciting stuff's going on in central city and they're sitting talking about it in star labs this episode felt like you could feel the sticks you could see the sticks that little visit to jake's cafe you could see that the fact that nancy's seen the uh the sandman behind jake in the dream the fact that we think maybe Jake might have been haunted by it as well. Maybe he saw his own death. I don't know. But the fact is, this episode was so contained. And yet you could feel everything that was going on in Horseshoe Bay. Horseshoe Bay is such a like lively place and such a lively like character in the show. In the same way that Central City isn't on The Flash anymore. And I just thought that was so expertly done. I love the tea. I'm sorry. It has to be said. Uh, <laughs> these The dreams and the sleepwalkings and all of the... Oh, it was so terrifying to me. Yeah. It was scary. And then seeing the effects on them in the real world from inside this. Oh, God, it was horrifying. Can we talk about uh, Nancy's dream? Yeah. She had another sexy dream. Yeah. She was like, that's the second one. I know. One of the I was series. like, I was like, ooh, this is fun. And I was like, oh, she just can't even have a steamy dream in peace. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and then she asked Ace about it. She's like, what, was, what did you dream? And he was like, well, I don't remember what his dream was, but, and she was like, yeah, mine was just like, yeah, you know, I'm not dealing with some things. And I was like, <laughs> we're so close. We're you so close. That again. <laughs> <laughs> and I worried that it was a dream when he just like walked on an ice into a room. I was like, it's the middle of the night. There has to be more to it than this. And then of course there was, but like, yeah, wow. They didn't like dance around that. They threw you right into that scene. And then just the tension and the stakes went up. And then I was so willing to believe it too. I was like, you know, I was like, <laughs> it's, like it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> well, I love how they both put on like, I mean, I know that's what ended up being what she was actually wearing, but I had thought it from the beginning that it was dream besides the fact that he just popped in the room like that. I was like, not them both having their good shirts, shirts on. <laughs> like it's like she had her nice uh silky floral top and then he had a nice floral top on too that was kind of like a dress shirt and i was like they were like we're gonna dress y'all for this dream <laughs> we're gonna give the fans what they want for a moment <laughs> and then take it yeah. away just a moment mm -hmm. and to go back to what we were talking about with riverdale about delivering at the end of the season I'm not even annoyed about the fact that it was a dream. I think that they're, they're teasing us excellently here. I'm not annoyed about the fact that it was a dream. I'm not annoyed about the fact that Ace is still with Amanda. Mm -hmm. I'm not annoyed about the fact that Na uh, Nancy has this Agent Park thing going on because I know where we're going and I can't wait to get there. And I am so enjoying the ride on, 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 her, de on her way to that destination because uh, like when they can like take really high stakes storylines where everybody is about to die and then just throw something like that into the middle off and then go, JK, excellent i'm just having the best time watching this season yeah if you do it well i can't fault you and like even if you, you watch this episode like removed from anything else you're still getting the content even if they're yeah. not actually together like it's still present um and it, i've constantly i feel like it is like they're always like together geographically <laughs> 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 so like i don't know i'm i we still eat even if it's just a, a light snack you know mm -hmm. yeah the crumbs are there all the time. <laughs> I just want to see it from Ace's perspective soon. Because we're getting a lot of Nancy because she had repressed it so much. And like the the door that she had locked is unlocked and it is pushing open. And she's mm -hmm. letting it do its business, even though she's very aware he's in a relationship. Um, but I was like, Ace, I would like to see some Nancy feelings soon. I would like to see some awkwardness. Because um, I, I can't think of, besides him, you know, caring about her immensely and wanting her to be okay and being there for her forever. I want to see some ace gazing. I would like to yeah. see him gaze yeah. at Nancy. Yeah. yeah. So it's been like really subtle on his part. Mm -hmm. It has. And he's kind of, when the show started, he was kind of portrayed by like, as like the goofy comic relief of the show that maybe isn't all that deep. But as the show has gone on, you've seen, Ace is just like a well inside of him. He is so deep of a character. So I can't, I can't believe that he wouldn't have picked up on anything now, especially wasn't it Amanda asked him at one point, was there anything ever going on between you two? So um, I do hope we get to see more of it from his perspective. And I feel like we have a whole season to get there, I think. So I hope so, because at the end of the day, their scenes together are just amazing. And just don't tell me he didn't feel anything the way she's been feeling things in the last few scenes. 
Oh, he felt it. But oh, we're yeah. going to get probably some ace movement in episode five with Carson finding out that he's mm-hmm. involved in the Bobsy thing. <laughs> it was like, I can explain. I was like, <laughs> boy. <laughs> I know that was that was such a tense scene. I love that when they bring in the like tech nerd, but the tech nerd is actually the person responsible for that. We knew what was going to allow because they've been doing a good job telling us that this man went into this warehouse and came back out and to an associate. We knew that what picture was going to load there, and the fact that they made us wet. I don't know why it was such terrible quality to begin with, but the fact that they made us wet as the quality improved and Carson over Ace's shoulder. I was like, shut the laptop, shut the laptop, shut the laptop. <laughs> that man did not shut the laptop. He waited. He 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 knew his time was up so to speak anyway and that bless him that like naive but like oh dear kind of look at Carson yeah. oh my goodness I I Carson and Ace are such a good double act that we don't see enough so I hope we yeah. get some good good content from the next episode and Sabrina didn't you say last week that just because Ace kicked him out of the car doesn't mean that it's over like that's, yeah yeah that was not yeah. He made the right choice, but it's not, you know, he didn't finish that. <laughs> yeah, because he's talking about it, about how, you know, I did, I think in, in the previous episode, or maybe it was in um, episode four, where he said to, I think it was to Bess, I, I, did, I threw my car, like it's over. I was like, it's not over. <laughs> what, is it? what in what world is that? Ever? I mean, subconsciously he knew that, hence why his nightmares were about him being in the warehouse with bloody knuckles. Um, he had a feeling that the man um, that Mr. Bobs went to see was not in excellent condition. Like uh, he's aware of that. Didn't ask any questions. And I was like, I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to use all of our resources to save you. Because once again, <laughs> you were caught up in some BS. <laughs> like yeah. it's just not, because this is the second time. Last time it was because he was trying to find his, his brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now, kind of, like, I kind of want to. Is this bad? I kind of want to see, like, feral Ace. Like, I want to see if Ace can fight. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like no. Punch? <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know, he's he's got the muscles. Like, we've seen them in a couple scenes. Like, I want to. Can Can Ace fight when it gets down to it? I kind of want to see it. I kind of. I I don't think so, but I kind of want him to. I want him to be able to at least, um, you know, give you a good few punches. Like, yeah. he may not be able to carry the fight, but I'd love for him to be scrappy. Yeah, like, I'm just imagining a scene where, like, Ace has to fight and Nancy's there and she's, like, surprised. And she's like, yeah, I can do that. I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've, we've had a few of those scenes where Ace is revealed, like, a hidden talent and it just cuts to Nancy, who's, like, what watching him in, like, bemusement or bewilderment or yeah, awe or whatever. Like, <laughs> she's like... Uh, continues to con- like surprise her and <laughs> yeah. i love that because like when you surprise nancy like you can't that's not an easy thing to do like to surprise nancy but ace always does he does so i kind of i don't want to see ace in danger even though he is but like i think it would be like a funny and also a character development moment to be like he's like this chill easy going laid back like seemingly pacifist dishwasher line cook but like he can get into a scrap Mm-hmm. he just doesn't <laughs> maybe he will surprise us and nancy then because could you imagine if it was like he does carry the fight and it's he's just like yeah so i used to get in trouble in, in elementary school for fighting <laughs> and i kind of leveled up in middle school i chilled out in high school because dad was like you will end up in juvie <laughs> and he's just like all right because he's i i know i kind of like it you're right let's have it yeah i don't want it to, he doesn't need to be like riverdale archie where like no. <laughs> he throws himself into fight, like he actively searches for fights because he wants to be in pain because that's a whole other dis- discussion about archie's trauma <laughs> he wanted pain inflicted on himself anyway didn't mean to get in that but like i don't want it to be that like i just want it to be like the way that nancy drew d- pulls these punches on us where it's like mm-hmm. oh that's surprising but it's still kind of light and Mm-hmm. yeah i think it'd be fun somebody tell us in the comments if we get a taste of that or if we're, i'm just like daydreaming <laughs> <laughs> i've been watching too much of the night agent <laughs> speak that into existence right um <laughs> Um, I know, but I'm eager to see what kind of trouble S is in. Is he in trouble with the law or will he be in trouble with Amanda's father more off, more going forward? Because I feel like the second one's more interesting to me because at the end of the day, if you know S, him picking his father-in-law up, father-in-law up, it's not that big a deal. He could say he saw the blood on his hands and told him to get out of the car and hasn't seen him since. If you're working with Carson, I think 
he'll be fine. But of course, there's the danger will, will what will happen going forward. But I just want to, I think now is a good moment to praise this episode. I think from the top down, every intricate part of this episode was so planned out right from the beginning. I always say it's like we do a two-parter right at the right time. It carried over from the last week or the last episode about how they were exhausted after being interviewed over the serial killer. And then I saw S yawned and him, him and Nancy yawned at the same time. And they both just kind of walked past each other like, sup? as though we've been through the trenches <laughs> together, um, but we're not going to talk about it now. And then Carson uh, getting affectionate towards the DA, who is also investing the frozen hearts, or investigating the frozen hearts killer case. But at the same time, she's investigating this case, which leads S and Carson back into each other's lives. Every single part of this episode from top through end was planned out and it tied into the overall story, in spite of the fact it was very much a standalone episode excellently done i can't wait to see where any of the stories go next but i don't even know if it's one of my favorite episodes of nancy drew because every single one of episodes of my of nancy drew is one of my favorites but i just i feel like we get so used to how good the show is it's easy to overlook it at this point but i just thought this episode juggled everything mm. excellently i think it has to be more Oh, no, you go. I have three more ace things that I want to get to. <laughs> yeah, my, mine are ace things, but I just also think that it did well to seed plots, I think, that we're going to um, deal with with George and um, Nick. Like, mm -hmm. Nick's fear that he poured all of himself into this youth center and it's not going to go in the direction that he wanted because he's finally feels like he has a purpose um, and he has been a character who's felt lost for a lot of the series and he I, it makes sense for him to feel like what if this is the thing that also doesn't work out because things don't tend to work out for him. And then mm -hmm. George's fear that Nick is only getting married to her because she has a decade left to live. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh, I'm just, are these our D plots? Because I would love to like um, have like these small scenes with them for them to sort of untangle uh, their like what's going on in their psyches. Like subconsciously, does George really feel like Nick doesn't want to be with her at this point in time? to be in, married at least. And does Nick really feel that perhaps he did waste his time with, with the youth center? Or is he just concerned he's trying to make things work in Horseshoe Bay when he should be elsewhere? Mm -hmm. I mean, and there is a lot that you're right. That was definitely very much like the D plot of the episode and the, the, the like subtle scenes, very, very, very small ones. But at the end of the day, again, ties right back into the overall storyline between the two. And I would like to see that explored more because I feel like George has just kind of accepted the fact that she has like 10 years to live and they throw it in, in like a line of dialogue here and there. And I do, I feel like next youth center will obviously continue to be an important part. And then he'll have that big moment where he'll remember whether he, what he's doing is the right thing and then he's using his money for a good cause but I agree I feel like there's more growth with that just like of course the best kind of end of it got the biggest focus this week while Ness and uh, the frozen horse killer were more supporting roles but this episode juggled everything and I feel like every single scene in this episode will lead to something more in the season which is why that kind of excites me for season three I know when it started we didn't really know where it was going but I feel like we have more of a direction now and I'm looking forward to seeing what that actually leads to because like temperance wasn't even in the episode and she played like an important role as far as dialogue goes so yeah it's doing it's it, it's somehow managing to hold our interest as, in every storyline at the moment speaking of things that will have an impact going forward ace still has that box of mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that was it that's where george wanted to dive into the box and he's like Bess. no <laughs> <laughs> so there's something in there so no, gotta keep an eye on that second ace thing the power of his mother's cookies. <laughs> I want to try one. And third, <laughs> when he arrived with those handcuffs. <laughs> and they gave oh him that God. look. That look of amusement. <laughs> he's like, my dad's a cop, what? Um, but no, Eva, I actually don't remember if that was Bess or George about the chocolates. He just tossed it in the back. But he always has great one-liners. There's another ace moment right before... Um, he has to ask Car tell Carson like it's <laughs> I need help but um the when Carson's like with all the stuff that you know you could be a billionaire and he's like who says I'm not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Carson didn't know what to do <laughs> Ace is definitely he has like some shoe boxes of money in the floorboards and like <laughs> he's, he's been investing since he was 15 like I, I believe it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally buy that from him but then also wasn't it the one-liner um again dramatic episode everybody wakes up with cuts and bruises and 
Bess is bleeding from her eyes. Is that the price, by the way? Because she wasn't injured in her dream that much. So is that a price for her? But like all of the serious stuff going on. And then Ace is just like, does anybody remember where we put the keys of the handcuffs? <laughs> <laughs> I love that man. <laughs> was that the act break too? Like a cut to the I think so, yeah. commercial? <laughs> yeah. oh, I love it. And then they come back and they're all just out of it. I love it. <laughs> oh, Ace. Mm. I love that man. Um, NC2 is such a great show. Just really, truly mm -hmm. a wonderful, wonderful show. I'm actually getting sad um, the closer we're getting to being caught up for gonna, season four. I was going to say that too. These episodes are just like randomly... It hit me i was like because it, it was giving me so much like old school cw vibes i was like yeah this the air is gonna end in august mm -hmm. and it kind of like <laughs> need to appreciate every second of nancy drew <laughs> <laughs> yeah we live in the moment and have fun with it like we're doing with riverdale yes yes i feel like i'm gonna I know already, though, I'm going to miss Nancy. No, I'm not going to miss Riverdale. I think Riverdale's not going to hit me until we actually get into August. Unless, like, where they are all the way through season seven. It's, like, hit after hit after hit with the episode mm -hmm. for Riverdale. Then I'll be like, well, if we could have gotten this the whole time, we right, could have had yeah. a season eight. <laughs> <laughs> like... Riv Riv Riverdale, to me, is a bit like The Flash, although it's doing a better job at the moment. Sorry, not sorry. Um, it's like the flashing as that veteran show you knew the end was coming and you're ready to let go regardless of how good or bad it is. Whereas Nancy is more like a Stargirl situation and then it continues to hit its prime year after year after year. And you're like, we could have had two, three, maybe four more seasons of this. And it feels wrong that it's snuffed out. But even at that, I have no doubt that the writers will make it feel like this four season story was supposed to be how it was from the beginning because mm -hmm. every, they just keep knocking it out of the park every episode, every season. And mm -hmm. The fact that we we basically have two full seasons left to go excites me. I know not everyone does because they're all waiting on season four to start, but I'm just living in the moment for season three before we eventually do the same thing for season four. Yeah. And there's something about less than five seasons that feels like we're a little bit cheated or like it's a little unfair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not always true because sometimes there can be a great series that ends too soon, but three was all they needed and it was yeah. iconic regardless. But it does kind of feel like... Ugh, could have just gotten to five that would have felt like such mm -hmm. a, a huge like legacy for this underdog show kind of like dynasty where it five seasons a hundred plus episodes later that's remarkable to me um but yeah i wish we gotten one more but thankful for that we got anything at all mm -hmm. yeah True. <laughs> I, I do want to manifest something though because i want a nancy tree movie I feel like yes. if we're going to do low cost things. I feel like a Nancy Drew movie wouldn't have to cost a lot. Like they could just do practical effects. We already have the writers and the actors like to get together. Like why not do a, a Nancy Drew holiday film? <laughs> like, yeah. Instead of the Walters. Halloween special. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, we did say this about Tom Swift that you could see like tom swift and and something tom swift and the like the books like i'm saying yeah and so i always reference the show psych <laughs> even though i <laughs> don't think i've seen a full season of the show i just have like some weird deep love for it but though it's nancy does give me psych this season with the the cuts to her memories of like mm -hmm. the things they did that in psych where he would like cut to the things that he observed and i really like that in the season of nancy because i don't think they did that in one and two right the, like the little flashes to the things that she observed yeah I no i don't think so i think it's supposed to be that she's being more detective like the season so we're seeing yeah. more of that so i like that angle and, and it gives me psych and like after psych ended after eight seasons they've done three movies yeah exactly like, there's a world in which standalone movies work Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel and, like we can get the gang together for two months to film a movie in Vancouver. I don't know. Right, yeah. And like, even if <laughs> even, even if there's one where you couldn't, all we need is Nancy and maybe one or two of the supporting characters. Now, I would not want that to be how the universe would end. Like, if they're going to do a one more movie, they should have all of them together. But like, if, if these movies were successful and easily distributed, you didn't need all the knowledge of the show to go into, you could do one 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 or just focused on Nancy in a different city or something. Give us something different than what the show did. That would justify it being a movie. But like, like, like we said, Nancy Drew and the Drew crew, Nancy Drew and the mystery of this, Nancy Drew and, and the Canaries, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you, you know what I mean? Nancy Drew and Tom Swift, the crossover we never got. You know what I mean? Like just so, so much potential there. I want or the, the Cheryl spinoff. Didn't I say that somewhere? I think that was in a brainstorm with, with you guys that I said I, that, um, did I say, no, Bess and Cheryl. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I want them yes. to do yes. witchcraft yes. together. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that'd be so yeah. fun. I just and they should do it with Riverdale and Nancy Drew crossover. Which yeah. I mean, obviously they don't have time this season. But if we were to do a standalone movie, just send Shale to Hershey Bay for some random reason. <laughs> like in Yeah. She- do it. And just pretend that every CW show has existed in the same cinematic universe. <laughs> you know, oh my goodness, so much fun. <laughs> I, I just I think CW will always be great. I just want CW to be great in the next star era too. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, before we end though, we do have to finally toast ourselves because we are <laughs> far pa- we are past 50 episodes, but we um we hit 50 episodes at the top, not the top of the year, February, whatever month it was. Um and it's just really exciting to have been on this pod for that long. Um, and I love doing this every week with you guys. Same. Yeah. And I enjoy hearing, uh, seeing all of the comments from people and the Nancy fans, especially when they're really nice and constructive and con- can, are an extension of our discussion. It's really fun to see that community that's slowly building. Yeah. It is. And that's what the CW has always been about. And I feel like the three of us decided to start this in like such a happier time for this network. Um, <laughs> and it's it's become like a trauma response now. And I think we like we've got we, we we've gotten each other and yeah, we log on together. every two, every Thursday morning to trauma bond over the CW. <laughs> <laughs> And there is no one I would rather be in the trench as well. <laughs> Same. I mean, it is just so funny though that like end of what was the end of 2021? We were yep. we were like, it's gonna be so fun to do a CW yeah. podcast. At the top of the year, and CW was like, so they took the credit <laughs> I mean, card. We're historians, guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are calling history in this very moment. Um, but I honestly don't think I would have gotten through this year and losing all those shows all at once without this. So I mean, I I hope we were able to channel that and give the same thing to the fans who listened. Um. Because like like you said, CW is a community and I feel like we all got each other through this past year together. Mm-hmm. But like on the positive note, just to have done 50, 52 episodes now, it's just very proud of what we've accomplished so far. And I can't wait to see how we continue to call history going into the future. And cheers to us, really. Yeah, and as all of our us. listeners. Like it's just, okay. it's been grand. All right, well, that is it for this week's pod. Um, I'm Sabrina. I'm Michael. And I'm Reed. We're the CW Spiral. Thanks for listening.